Good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindu news analysis by Shankar IIS Academy for the date 13th May 2020 these are the list of articles chosen for today's analysis it has been given along with the page numbers of different editions of Hindu newspaper the link for the handwritten notes in the pdf format and the time stamping for the displayed articles is provided in the description box and for the benefit of smartphone users it is also provided in the comment section let's move on to our first news article analysis The first discussion for today is based on this editorial which talks about the approach of central government towards the state governments in tackling this COVID-19 pandemic. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See as you know during the lockdowns of 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 of this COVID-19 pandemic the central government has issued guidelines to the state governments from time to time and these guidelines have been issued under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. Now this editorial is concerned about the top down approach which is being followed by the central government in tackling the pandemic rather than treating the state governments as equal which is what is truly we refer to as cooperative federalism as you know the term federalism means the independence of the union government and the state governments of a country in their own spheres but india is not merely a federal country rather our constituent assembly adopted the concept of cooperative federalism over federalism and the term cooperative federalism means administrative cooperation between the center and the states and a partial dependence of the states upon payments from the center here what you should understand is that though indian constitution envisions a strong center the cooperative federalism doesn't necessarily result in weaker states rather the progress of the whole nation depends upon the cooperation between the union and the state governments But if you see the recent set of guidelines issued by the central government to the states to tackle this COVID-19 pandemic where the states are only being allowed to either increase or dilute the restrictions this indicates the centralized approach of the union rather than cooperative federalism and according to the authors of this editorial this approach of the union is counterproductive and it is unconstitutional first let us see how this is counterproductive to explain it the authors have listed three scenarios in the editorial the first scenario is that the central government in its latest guidelines has classified all districts in the country as red zones orange or green zones and this segregation of zones is to lift lockdown restrictions in an area specific manner but the states and the union territories have raised concerns that there was no need to keep economic activity on hold in an entire district when cases have been only reported from a small portion of the district then the second scenario is with respect to the state of kerala as you know probably kerala is the best performing state in terms of its response to this pandemic but the state government of kerala was directed by the center to refrain from relaxing the restrictions in the state see even though kerala has near perfect recovery rate and kerala has seen a steep fall in the number of cases of covid-19 infections the central government did not trust the wisdom and judgment of the state government in the matter according to the author then the third scenario is center's move to increase the state's dependence upon the center see as you know it is the states which act as first responders to the pandemic so supplying the states with adequate funds is a prerequisite in effectively tackling the crisis but what the center has done is it has declared that corporations which are donating to pm cares fund can avail csr exemptions but the corporates or corporations which are donating towards any chief minister's relief fund cannot avail any exemptions now this directly this incentivizes or discourages the donation to the relief fund it also diverts the potential state revenues to the pm cares fund and further it makes the states largely dependent upon the center Not only this the revenue streams of several states have also dried up because of the ban on liquor sale and uh, due to the negligible sale of petrol or diesel and due to lack of uh, land dealings and registration of agreements etc and even the states gst collections have also been severely affected because their dues have not been disbursed by the center now all this together has made it difficult for the states to cover the expenses of salaries pensions and welfare schemes so that is why author is saying that this approach of center is counterproductive 
Now let us see how the centers move is unconstitutional. As you know, under the seventh schedule of Indian Constitution, there are three lists: the Union List, the State List, and the Concurrent List. The Union List is the list on which Parliament can legislate laws, and the State List is the list on which state legislatures can legislate laws, and the Concurrent List is the list on which both the Parliament and the state legislatures can legislate. Now the subjects which are not covered under any of these are in the residuary list and as you know again parliament can only legislate laws on the subjects on the residuary list now this residuary power of parliament is provided under article 248 of the indian constitution which is read with entry 97 of union list this entry 97 mentions that any other matter not enumerated in list 2 or list 3 including any tax not mentioned in either of those lists So this was about the legislative powers of the center and the states. Now, not only this, even the executive powers of the center and the states, as per Article seventy three and Article one hundred sixty two of Indian Constitution, are coextensive with their respective legislative powers. This means that the center can only take executive actions in matters where the parliament has powers to legislate, and the state governments can only take executive actions in matters where the state legislatures have powers to legislate. but as we saw in the beginning the central government has issued guidelines to the state governments under the disaster management act of 2005 and if you see the subject disaster management is neither subject in state list nor in concurrent list it is not even specifically mentioned in union list and as we already saw any subject which is not listed in or mentioned in state list concurrent list and union list it comes under the residuary list and on those subjects parliament has the power to legislate now using this power only the central government has issued guidelines to the states under the disaster management act but particularly if you see the term disaster is a broader term which includes all disasters including pandemic so the central government has the powers to issue directions and guidelines to state governments for dealing with the pandemic in their states according to this provision but the question here is doesn't the states have the powers on matters related to public health because as you know the subject public health and sanitation is a specific field of legislation under entry 6 of state list so this would imply that states have the exclusive right to legislate and act on the matters concerning public health so here what is happening is the pandemic disaster of residual list versus the public health of state list so clearly the center's guidelines to the states for dealing with the pandemic infringe upon a field of legislation and executive action that is exclusively assigned to the states which is the public health then how to deal with this kind of overlap or infringement of subjects for this there are many number of judgments including the godfrey phillips versus the state of uttar pradesh 2005 case law the judgment in this case law uphold that the entries in the legislative lists must be interpreted harmoniously and if in case there is any overlap between two or more entries then the specific subject matter which is contained in a particular entry must be deemed to have been excluded from another entry which may deal with a more general subject matter the specific subject has more weightage and hence it must be excluded from the general subject so in our scenario according to the authors public health is a specific subject of the state and disaster is more general subject of the residual list hence the public health must be excluded from the disaster hence only the state governments can have power over the subject so this is one scenario now one more thing which you should note is another entry of concurrent list or another subject of concurrent list and this subject is entry 29 which mentions that prevention of the extension from one state to another of infectious or contagious diseases or pests affecting men animals or plants now this means both the parliament and state legislatures are competent to legislate on matters involving this particular subject which mentions about the interstate spread of contagious or infectious diseases now since this is a specific legislative subject provided in the concurrent list the same must be deemed to have been excluded from the parliament's residuary legislative powers also as we already saw 
So therefore, the Disaster Management Act, which has been enacted under Parliament's residuary legislative powers, cannot be applied to the prevention of interstate spread of contagious and infectious diseases, according to the authors. Now, not only this Disaster Management Act, but there is also a separate law known as Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897, which has the objective of preventing the spread of dangerous epidemic diseases. But however, under this act, it is the state governments which have the prerogative to take appropriate measures for containing the outbreak or spread of a contagious or infectious disease in their respective states. According to this Epidemic Diseases Act, the central government's powers are limited to taking measures for uh, inspecting and detaining persons who are traveling out of the country or who are traveling into the country. So even if this act will be amended in the future, according to the authors, it would not empower the central government to issue directions to the states to contain the pandemic within the state. But it can only deal with interstate spread of the disease, not the intrastate. Therefore, instead of resorting to this Epidemic Diseases Act, which gives powers to the states, the center has applied the Disaster Management Act, which has enabled the central government to override the state governments. But even this Disaster Management Act mandates the center that while issuing binding guidelines to the states, the central government must consult state governments before issuing such guidelines. This is as per Section 11, Clause 2 of Disaster Management Act. But to avoid this legislative mandate, the central government has resorted to ad hoc or temporary binding guidelines. Now, because of this temporary guidelines only, the center has all decision-making powers which has been obtained by the selective application of Disaster Management Act. So that is why the author has mentioned that this move of the center towards the state governments is plainly unconstitutional. And even the states are not legally bound to observe the directions or guidelines being issued by the central government. And the state governments would be well within their rights to challenge these guidelines provided by the center before the apex court also. Hence, the authors conclude by saying that the center must view the states as equals and it must take steps to strengthen their capabilities instead of increasing their dependence upon the center. So that is all about this editorial. In this editorial, we elaborately saw the approach of central government towards the state governments in providing guidelines for tackling this COVID-19 pandemic. And we also saw how this measure is being counterproductive and how this move is unconstitutional. So this open editorial is a good example of the top-down approach of central government rather than the bottom-up approach. With this, we come to the end of this discussion. Moving on to the next discussion, this news article talks about the recent conflict between USA and China. As we know, US and China have been continuing their war of words for quite some period. And even recently, U.S. has made severe criticism against the present Director General of WHO, saying that he is biased towards China in handling the COVID-19 pandemic. In this scenario, the latest issue between U.S. and China is regarding the status of Taiwan at the World Health Assembly. So, in this context, in this discussion, we will discuss in brief about the political history and the status of Taiwan, and then we will also see about the World Health Assembly. The syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, first know that Taiwan is also known as Republic of China. It is located in the Western Pacific Ocean, as you can see in this map, between Japan and the Philippines. And it is off the coast of southeastern China. And know that it was a colony of Netherlands for about 40 years in the early 17th century to mid 17th century. And then in the late 17th century, China's Qing dynasty gained control over Taiwan. Then after this, in the year 1895, Japan acquired Taiwan after the First Sino-Japanese War. And then as you know, Japan was defeated in World War II in the year 1945. So Taiwan was returned to nationalist Chinese control. Then after that, in the year 1949, Chinese communists defeated nationalist forces who were on the mainland China. And there they established the People's Republic of China. So at that time, the nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek moved his government, party and military to Taiwan. This is what resulted in the separation of Taiwan from China. 
Not only that, till the year 1971, Taiwan as the Republic of China only represented China in United Nations. But after that, the People's Republic of China, that is the mainland China, took over the China seat. So after this, Chiang's government also quickly lost its international standing. And at present, the scenario is that China has maintained its stand that Taiwan is its integral part. But this is disputed by Taiwan and even by other few countries. So this is the political situation of Taiwan and its relationship with China. Now the recent development is that Taiwan has urged WHO to allow it to rejoin as an observer state. But this was condemned by China. And in this scenario, few days back, the U.S. Senate, which is the upper house of U.S. Congress, has passed a bill, and this bill seeks the restoration of Taiwan in WHO. So you can see here that U.S.'s actions are opposite to the actions of China. So this has further escalated the U.S.-China issues. So how this problem will affect India? See, this problem is a concern to India because India is set to take over. as the next chairperson of world health assembly so once india becomes the chairperson india has to face a dilemma on whether to support usa or to support china so that means india will be struck between two rivals now here the world health assembly is important because it is the decision making body of world health organization this world health assembly is attended by delegations from all who member states and this assembly focuses on specific health agenda which is prepared by the executive board and the main functions of this assembly are to determine the policies of the organization then to appoint the director general and then also to supervise the financial policies and then finally to review and approve the proposed program budget and also remember that the health assembly is held annually in geneva so in this background few days back what happened was the secretary of state of usa had convened a seven nation virtual meeting of foreign ministers and even india's external affairs minister also participated in this virtual meeting see though this meeting was mainly focused on moving the global economy forward still it was part of us's effort to gain support to its demand regarding the world health assembly or who and the news article also mentions that india's external affairs minister will take part in the virtual meeting of shanghai corporation organization today and this meeting will be led by china and russia so it is obvious that china will put pressure on india to take decisions in china's favor and not only that according to this news article india will chair the world health assembly for the next 3 years so this period is crucial because currently who is facing criticism while handling the covid-19 pandemic so let us hope that india will use its diplomatic skills to balance both usa and china and india could come up with a better outcome so that is all about this discussion in this discussion we saw about the recent conflict between usa and china regarding the status of taiwan at the world health assembly and then we also saw why this issue is important to india with this we come to the end of this discussion the split practice question will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion this news article discusses about the functioning of rajya sabha over the years it looks at the disturbing trends in the recent times and it also analyzes whether rajya sabha has been an obstructionist with respect to passing legislations the syllabus that is relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference now this news article highlights that the indian constitution provides for parity or equality of powers between the lok sabha and rajya sabha but with an exception in some cases if you look at the special powers of rajya sabha rajya sabha has power to pass a resolution allowing parliament to legislate on subjects in the state list which is provided under article 249 of the constitution then rajya sabha has the power for creating all india services and this is under article 312 of indian constitution and then under articles 352 356 and 360 rajya sabha also has power for approving proclamations of emergency and proclamations of president's rule when the lok sabha is dissolved and besides these powers rajya sabha can also pass resolution for removing the vice president through article 67 of indian constitution so these are some of the special powers of rajya sabha but however the money bill or finance bills can only be introduced in lok sabha which only can approve the demands for grants 
so like this the article also discusses the possible variations in the composition of both the houses also if you look at the composition of rajya sabha it is a continuing chamber one third of its members retire every second year and they are eligible for re-election and re-nomination and parliament through the representation of people's act of 1951 has prescribed the term of office of the members of rajya sabha as 6 years and note that this is not fixed by constitution rather it is prescribed by the parliament but however if you consider lok sabha elections to lok sabha are held every 5 years and even before that when there is dissolution of lok sabha so these are some of possible variations in the composition of both the houses then after this the news article highlights the effects on legislations caused by the numbers in the rajya sabha the news article highlights that during the past 68 years since the first general elections of 1952 the government of the day had a majority in rajya sabha only for 29 years and the government was in a minority for 39 years and this includes the unbroken stretch of the past 31 years also and this noticeable divergence in numbers in the two houses of parliament does not indicate any adverse impact on the broader course of legislation except in some few cases so what are these exceptions let us see these exceptions in detail so far parliament had held only three joint sittings to resolve the differences between the both the houses and the first instance was in the 1961 when the then nehru government enjoyed a majority in rajya sabha but the dowry prohibition bill suffered a defeat and then in the year 1978 the banking services commission repeal bill of 1977 was rejected by the rajya sabha and then after that in the year 2002 the prevention of terrorism bill of 2002 could not pass the rajya sabha scrutiny apart from this in certain cases rajya sabha was also considered as regressive Firstly it was considered as regressive when it rejected the constitution 24th amendment bill of 1970 and this bill was for abolishing the privy purses to erstwhile rulers Rajya Sabha rejected this bill after it was passed by the Lok Sabha and then in the year 1989 the constitution 64th and 65th amendment bills which sought to empower the local governments did not get the required special majority in the Rajya Sabha even though the government had the numbers so in these instances rajya sabha was considered as regressive apart from this the spirit of cordiality or we can say the friendliness between the two houses was reduced in certain occasions first it was reduced when rajya sabha members were not included in the public accounts committee in the year 1952 and then again it was reduced when the income tax amendment bill of 1953 was introduced in the rajya sabha but some members questioned its certification as a money bill by the lok sabha speaker it is because as you know money bill shall not be introduced in rajya sabha according to the constitution then after this the cordiality between both the houses was disturbed when lok sabha speaker referred the major port trust bill of 1963 to its select committee without involving rajya sabha members after this the news article also highlights several instances when rajya sabha has been effective and this includes the occasions when the amendments proposed by the rajya sabha were accepted by the other house like as it was accepted in the case of travancore cochin appropriation vote on account bill of 1956 then it was accepted in the union duty of excise distribution bill and then in the income tax bill of 1961 etc and here you should note that during these years the government of the day enjoyed a majority in rajya sabha and after this there were also occasions when rajya sabha checked the hasty legislations passed by the lok sabha which in turn made rajya sabha as effective and these occasions include the prevention of corruption bill of 1987 and then the dock worker safety health and welfare bill of 1986 and finally there were also instances when the members of different parties rose to the occasion in passing landmark legislations even when the present government does not have the required numbers in the rajya sabha and these instances include the laws relating to gst then insolvency and bankruptcy code then the triple talaq legislation then unlawful activities legislation and then reorganization of jammu and kashmir and then citizenship amendment legislation and so on so from the above discussion you can say that 
There are few disagreeing notes during this long journey of legislation between Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha but there is no case for terming Rajya Sabha as obstructionist that is what this article tries to convey after this towards the end of the article some rising disturbing trends has been listed using the four parameters and these trends happened over the years from 1997 to 2019 and the first parameter is productivity it has been decreasing since 1997 till 2019 and the second one is time spent on legislation and this has been steady at 29 percentage over these years that is for more than 20 years and then the third parameter is oversight function performed by rajya sabha as you can see it has been decreasing over these years and then the last parameter is the deliberations of rajya sabha which has been improving in these years so finally the news article concludes that both rajya sabha and lok sabha must remain constructive partners despite the divergence in their composition and they must be guided by the spirit of cooperation for the peaceful functioning of parliament so that is all about this news article discussion This news article has provided an overview of the functioning of Rajya Sabha over these years. It has listed the special powers, then what is the difference of composition between Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, and then it has also listed the instances where the numbers in Rajya Sabha had effect on the legislation, and we also saw the instances where Rajya Sabha has been effective. So that is all about this discussion. These types of articles will be helpful for you in writing a mains answer. so take note of these points with this we come to the end of this discussion the split practice questions will be discussed in the last session moving on to the next discussion this discussion is about these two news articles in this this first news article mentions that the union health ministry has made it compulsory to install the arogya setu app for all the returnees and the returnees which is mentioned here are the people like migrant laborers who are returning to hometown and also those who are coming from abroad the union health ministry has taken this decision to enable better contact surveillance and suitable medical intervention and in the similar context this next news article mentions that railways has also made it mandatory to install this app for those who are traveling via the special trains as you know railways has started uh, 15 pairs of special trains from may 12th onwards that is from yesterday onwards So now railways has also mandatorily asked people to install this app. So in this context only we have framed this question which is based on Arogya Setu. And the question asks Arogya Setu often seen in news is So to answer this question first let us know about this mobile app as you know central government launched this arogya setu mobile app it is aimed to connect health services and people to fight this covid-19 pandemic Along with this it is also a digital contact tracing tool and it is a platform to disseminate information regarding the covid-19 pandemic and as you know contact tracing is nothing but the identification and follow up of persons who may have come into contact with a person who is already infected with the deadly virus and in our context the deadly virus is covid-19 so on a whole we can say that this app will enable people to assess themselves the risk of them catching the coronavirus infection the app will calculate this based on the person's interaction with others and also by using cutting edge bluetooth technology algorithms and artificial intelligence the app will also use smartphones gps to track the contact and location trails see how it works is once this app is installed in a smartphone then the app detects other devices which are in its proximity that have already installed the arogya setu app then the app will calculate the risk of infection based on the sophisticated parameters if any of these contacts or persons is tested positive so in this way the app will enable and help the government to take necessary timely steps for assessing the risk of spread of covid-19 infection and it will also help the government in ensuring isolation wherever it is required since this is a mobile app one among the many doubts which people have is about the privacy so for that the government has ensured that this app's design ensures privacy because the personal data collected by this app is encrypted using the state of art technology and it stays secure on the phone and this is until it is needed for facilitating any medical intervention 
So currently know that this app is available in 11 languages and this app has been developed in public private partnership by the National Informatics Centers which functions under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Now if you look at this question the first option mentions a mobile app which enables people to assess themselves for the risk of catching COVID-19 infection. This is the correct statement. This statement correctly defines Arogya Setu. So hence the correct answer to this question is option A. Now let us take another question. Now this question is based on the Global Nutrition Report of 2020. We have taken this question because it has been released recently. Know that this report is a multi-stakeholder initiative. It consists of a stakeholder group, independent expert group and report secretariat. Now in this, the stakeholder group comprises of high-level members of government of donor organizations, of civil society, multilateral organizations and the business sector. And this group functions with an objective of making a world free from malnutrition in all its forms. Now this 2020 report focuses mainly on country level progress towards some of the 2025 global nutrition targets. Now know that the global nutrition targets were endorsed by World Health Organization member states in the year 2012. Now, these targets are aimed at improving maternal nutrition, infant nutrition and young child nutrition. And the member states are committed to monitoring the progress with respect to these. So, these are the targets. It includes 40% reduction in the number of children who are under the age of 5 and are stunted. And it includes 50% reduction of anemia in women who are of reproductive age. And then it also aims to reduce and maintain childhood wasting to less than 5%. So these are the other targets in this global nutrition targets. Now with respect to this report, let us uh, discuss the important findings of the report. This report has identified India as one of the country with highest rates of domestic inequalities in malnutrition. For example, largest disparities or differences in stunting were observed in countries like India, Nigeria and Indonesia. In these countries, the level of stunting has varied fourfold across communities. And as per this report, in India, one in two women of reproductive age is anemic. The report also found that one in three children who are under five years of age are stunted and also one in five children under five years of age are wasted. Apart from this, the report also highlights the inequalities in stunting. The report mentions that stunting prevalence is 10.1 percentage higher in rural areas and in this, one of the worst affected regions is Uttar Pradesh with over 40 percentage of stunting level. The report also noted that the rates of overweight or obesity city has reached 20.7 percentage in adult women and 18.9 percentage in adult men. So you can see that there is coexistence of uh, undernutrition and uh, overweight or obesity. So that means India faces the double burden of malnutrition. So we can say that India is uh, likely to miss the 2025 nutrition targets. Now if you look at this question, the first statement mentions it focuses on country level progress towards the 2025 global nutrition targets endorsed by WHO member states to improve maternal, infant and young child nutrition. This statement is correct. This is the objective of this report. Now the second statement mentions it is released by United Nations System Standing Committee on Nutrition. Now this statement is incorrect because initially we saw that this report is a multi-stakeholder initiative consisting of a stakeholder group, independent expert group and report secretariat and it is not released by this UNSCN. And here the question asks for the correct answer and the correct answer to this question is option A, one only. Now let us take the next question. This question is based on geographical indications. We often see news on new GA tags. Even yesterday we saw some products which has been given the GA tag. So that means this topic is very important from the prelims perspective. And as you know, geographical indication is an indication which is used on products that have a specific geographical origin. And GA tag aims to preserve the qualities and reputation of a product from that particular defined geographical locality. So in this scenario, yesterday, two products have been given geographical indication tag. One is Jharkhand's Sorai Kovar painting and the second one is Telangana's Telia Rumal. Let us see about these products first. Now the first one is Jharkhand's Sorai Khovar painting. Now know that 
the tribal communities of jharkhand and west bengal celebrate a festival called as sorai in the month of october to november they celebrate this festival to welcome their winter harvest they celebrate to worship their cattle as the goddess of wealth and also to offer a thanksgiving to the forces of nature and this festival is celebrated by the tribal communities such as santal munda orao prajapati khurmi etc now what happens is the tribal women decorate their mud houses with designs of flowers fruits sparrows peacocks squirrels cows and various other nature inspired designs and these wall paintings of jharkhand are traditionally known as the sorai which is obviously named after the festival and traditionally these paintings were painted on the walls of the mud houses but now they are seen on other surfaces too now this art has two major stylistic divisions one is based on marriage and the other is based on harvest seasons and traditionally the sorai paintings are linked to the winter harvest of crops in jharkhand and the kovar art is done during weddings it is said that the bridal chambers is usually decorated with kovar paintings and also know that this sorai kovar painting is primarily practiced in the district of uh, hazari bag of jharkhand but in the recent years for promotional purposes it is also seen in other parts of jharkhand now the next product is telangana's telia rumal see telia rumal literally means oily handkerchief now as the name suggests the yarn used for making this handkerchief is treated with oil now the products used for the treatment of the yarn are sheep dung castor pod ashes and oil now the treated yarn which is used for the length and width is tied and dyed in accordance with the predetermined geometrical design and this telia rumal cloth involves intricate handmade work with cotton loom and it displays a variety of designs and motifs in three particular colors they are red black and white i know that telia rumal can only be created using the traditional hand loom process and not by any other mechanical means otherwise the quality of the rumal would be lost now this telia rumal is important from historical perspective also because during the nizam's dynasty a small backward village of telangana region at that time which was in the then andhra pradesh had about 20 families who were engaged in hand loom weaving and they were patronized by the rich muslim families and the nizam rulers it is said that the officers who were working in the court of nizam would wear the telia rumal as a symbolic representation of status and this telia rumals were also worn by princesses as veil at the erstwhile court of nizam of hyderabad and it is also worn as turban cloth by arabs in the middle east so based on this speciality only these products have been given gi tags now if you look at this question three pairs are given on one side gi tag and on the other side the state which they belong to is given Now the first pair is Sorai Khovar paintings. It has been paired with Jharkhand, and it is a correct pair. Now the second pair is Telia Rumal. It has been paired with Assam. It is an incorrect pair because just now we saw that this Telia Rumal belongs to Telangana. So if second statement is incorrect, and here the question asks for the correctly matched pairs, so you can arrive at the correct answer, which is option B, one and three only. The third pair mentions Sri Vili Puttur Palkova, and it belongs to the state of Tamil Nadu only. It is a correctly matched pair. Now let us move on to the practice questions sessions for the previously discussed news articles. Now this question asks. Constitution of India has given special powers to Rajya Sabha. In this context, to do which among the following, Rajya Sabha is empowered. First one is it can authorize Parliament to make law on a subject enumerated in the State List. This is correct. This is a special power of Rajya Sabha according to Article two hundred and forty nine of Indian Constitution. Now the second one is creation of All India Services. This is also. correct because according to article 312 of indian constitution rajya sabha has powers for creating all india services now the third one is proclamation of national emergency now this option is vaguely saying proclamation of national emergency it is incorrect because rajya sabha can issue proclamation of national emergency only when lok sabha is dissolved but not under normal circumstances so that is why it is incorrect Hence the correct answer to this question is option A 1 and 2 only now this next question asks the world health assembly 
often seen in news is and you know the correct answer is option d which is it is the decision making body of world health organization don't confuse it with option b so this is a direct question now let us take one mains question based on gs paper 2 The question asks elaborate the constitutional position of Rajya Sabha as compared with Lok Sabha in the above context discuss the effectiveness of Rajya Sabha in the recent times now as you can see this question has two parts first you can mention the constitutional position of Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha where you can mention the points about where Rajya Sabha is equal to Lok Sabha then you can mention the points where Rajya Sabha is unequal to Lok Sabha and you can also mention the special powers of rajya sabha according to constitution then for the second part of the question you can focus on the effectiveness of rajya sabha which we already discussed in the article discussion and you can also add your own view points for enriching the answer with this we have come to the end of today's hindu news analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation